Good morning. So um, we are almost done with the discussion of architecture. Um, today is the final topic on this before your exam. Maybe I should say a few words about the exam. <clears throat> I think the easiest way of doing that would be to uh, post a quiz on D2L. So the format will be similar to the format of your homeworks right now. Um, the questions um, will cover everything starting with assembly. Um, so let me actually go to, let me actually show you the schedule. Um, okay, so we'll cover everything starting from binary numbers, floating point, assembly programming, NASM, um, all the way through the rest of assembly programming. The bulk of the, bulk of the exam will be based on these topics. Um, I will relatively lightly touch on these topics, including the memory discussed today. Um, I know you guys didn't have a homework on that stuff. Um, that's okay. Um, I will just cover the major concepts from processor architecture and memory. So I'm not going to go too deep into this. If you just uh, read over the lectures, uh, maybe look into the book, you will be fine on this. This will be relatively easy stuff. Again, the bulk of it will be on the details we covered in these lectures, um, starting with binary numbers. Um, and uh, also the concepts we have practiced in the homework. So I hope that um, clears it up. I'll offer it as a D2L quiz. You guys will have a limited time to take the exam and to submit your answers. Um, I will make, I will set it up such that everyone has to take the exam during the same time. So um, I'll post more details in D2L on it, but that's the basic setup. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to email me. Okay, so the last topic in the computer, in the architecture section is about memory. There's a lot more to memory that, than what I'm gonna cover. Again, if you want the details, uh, consider signing up for a double E course on that stuff. Um, I used to teach a lot more of it in, when we used to have the architecture course, but um, in this course, I'm just kind of summarizing this to, to the major concepts. Okay, so suppose I'm asking you guys to write a report on the history of computing and the internet is down. What would you do? Well, you might find some series of books in a library like this. Um, and what you'll notice here is that we have, is that the library has the main storage of data, which is on all the shelves. That's where all the books reside. But then you see people reading at the bottom on the different tables and they only read a small number of books at a time, right? They don't bring down the whole library and stack it on the table um, in hope of accessing it. So this is quite similar to what happens in computer systems where the stacks of books represent the memory with all the data in it and a table represents a cache or a set of items that you can use um, that you can access quickly but um, you can't access everything on it and so the trick to this is to have uh, I don't know maybe an assistant that brings down the relevant books and places it, places it on your table just as you're thinking of reaching for that book. Okay, so that would give you the illusion of having the entire library on your table while the assistant is doing all the work of making it seem like that by bringing in the books as you might need them. Okay, so the reason that this illusion can happen or that uh, processors or assistants, can, or assistants can give you this illusion is because of two um, Kind of patterns of memory access. One is called temporal, temporal locality, where you are more likely to access, access items or books that you have recently read, right? So if we are within a function, um, for example, within a loop, we are likely to be accessing the same set of variables or the same set of memory locations. Um, 
right? This makes sense. We're working on some set of data that resides in memory. We're likely to be kind of reusing the same values or to reading uh, or to read and write from the same memory locations. Okay. Um, the other pattern, access pattern that happens quite often is spatial locality where we accessed items that are near each other. So for example, if you're walking through an array um, of say 10 elements, if you're accessing element two and three and four, you likely next to access element five. Um, so if we can move the whole array into, into, onto your table, then you're likely to keep walking to, you're likely to walk through the whole array before you access another array. Okay? So these two types of localities um, enable us to access a small set of data um, and, and allow us to keep that small set of data ready in our caches. Um, so the books that we're likely to access are on our table, that's the temporal locality, and then there's a spatial locality also at play in the libraries where books are organized by topic, not alphabetically, right? So you can go to a particular set of racks and access books on the same topic rather than run all over the library to find authors that are or titles that are organized alphabetically. Okay, so if we look at a memory access pattern in a program, let's say this program runs here in time, let me get my pointer, uh, in time from left to right, time's increasing here. So we're running some program and in this program we're making a bunch of function calls. Okay, so we call to the bottom and we return to the top. So first we're accessing, we're in this function running from left to right over time and we're access, accessing some memory that this function uses. Okay, um, Then we go down here and we're accessing some, some memory here and then we go down here. So what's happening actually is that this line represents our call stack, right? So here we call a function, here we return function, call a function, return function. And as, we're, as we are in this call stack, we're accessing some particular memory window. And then eventually we call down here, and now we need to move the memory window to a slightly different memory. Um, but you can see that this relatively small window, or basically the amount of data that our cache can hold, can kind of track our uh, call pattern, right? So we don't need to use the entire memory. We can just kind of use, uh, rely on memory that's that's stored in this, uh, in this space, okay? And so maybe we get to kind of this part where we just keep calling some function and returning from it, and we're able to exhibit both spatial locality where the data for all these functions is able to stay in memory, and we have temporal locality in that we keep accessing data um, over and over again. Okay. So when we think about memory, we can create an abstraction of it and think of it as a memory cell. Okay. So to write into a memory cell, we can select that cell saying, hey, we're writing here. Uh, we pass a control saying that we are writing and we're passing some data in that will be then recorded in this cell. Okay? To read data from memory, you also need to identify the address or identify the cell of the memory in, in, from which you want to read. You pass a control, which is a read signal, and then you extract the data on some wires, which is the, which is the sense or, or the data coming out. There are two major ways to implement memory. There's a lot of memory technologies. I used, I used to go over all of that, but um, some of the stuff is quite old, like magnetic storage or tape storage. So we don't re really need to understand all these technologies. Um, the major thing to understand is the two memory technologies that are used inside your, inside your computer, okay? So one is called DRAM, which is basically your, your main memory. Um, and the way it works is that you have data stored in some capacitor. Um, the value in that capacitor has to be periodically refreshed. Um, so you need current to, to kind of uh, rebuild the value in that capacitor. And then when you select the address, you have some address line, the electricity passes through the transistor, and then you can um, kind of read the data stored or the amount of voltage stored in this capacitor. So the nice thing about it is that you really just need one capacitor and one transistor for each bit. Right? So it's very, very efficient, but um, it happens to be slow because you need to read a whole bunch of things at a time. Um, you can just think of it as slowish, 
I mean, much faster than disk, but still slowish, um, but very compact. Okay? And then you have um, SRAM, which is used for your cache. It's a much faster memory, but it's um, much more expensive to, um, to, to build because it takes all these different transistors. And it's kind of a thing, the way this circuit works is that when you apply voltage, it will kind of stay in the stable left position or stable right position. Um, so you can kind of apply voltage and flip it from one state to one other, either one or zero. Um, but you need to continually apply voltage to kind of keep this uh, circuit in a particular state. Okay. Um, the nice thing here is that you can read this one bit at a time, and so it's it's uh, you don't have to read a whole bunch of bits to read kind of the eight or you know thirty two or sixty four bits you want, um, and so this makes it much faster than than DRAM, but much more expensive uh, in terms of real estate because you need all these wires and all these different um, uh, transistors. Okay. So SRAM memory will generally be used in, in caches while DRAM will be used in your main memory. And then your disk storage used to be magnetic. Uh, now it's based on flash memory. The advantages of those is that you don't need electricity to maintain data, um, but again, they're going to be much slower. Okay, so if we look a little bit more deeply into this, we want to build a, uh, a memory system on a particular uh, real estate of transistors, right? Um, and so if you look at SRAM memory, uh, typical access time is going to be very, very fast, but it's much more expensive per gigabyte, right? Because we need these extra transistors. So DRAM is going to be slower, but cheaper, and then flash and magnetic, magnetic disk gets um, slower and, and cheaper, right? So um, if you had to build a system that's uh, maybe you only have a budget of $500 on this, right? I think that's the question here. Yeah, so if you only have $500 to build a system, a memory system, well, you can't really, I mean, you could allocate it all to SRAM, but then um, you're going to have maybe maximum of one gigabyte of memory, which isn't a whole lot, right, for everything that you need to store in your computer. So, okay. We're gonna say, well, we'll allocate some money here and then some money here because it's still fast, but it's cheaper and then, you know, some money here. So you wanna kind of balance the amount of memory uh, that is available at each reading speed or reading writing speed um, such that your programs can run quickly. Um, right? It doesn't make sense to allocate too much here because even though it's going to be fast, you're not going to have a whole lot of memory in that computer. Um, right, so maybe you want to allocate more money in DRAM, but then there's the same trade-off where you don't want everything in here because it's actually slower than this, and it still doesn't provide you enough space, right? So we want to kind of distribute our memory allocation across all the different technologies. Um, all right, and again, what we want to do is provide this illusion of everything being on your library table or everything being an SRAM while uh, so your program thinks that while well, most of the data actually resides on disk. Okay. So the way this is implemented is we're going to have a, a, a memory hierarchy where all the data is actually stored on disk, but then we're going to copy some set of data, maybe the data needed for your program into the main memory. And then we're going to access the data that your processor actually needs in a given call stack uh, to take advantage of the spatial and temporal locality into SRAM, um, which can then be, which is then attached to your CPU when it's very fast. And then even out of SRAM, data is copied into your registers um, to actually do computations, which is faster still. So a memory hierarchy looks like this. You have these different levels where you have registers at level zero. These are super fast. Then you have, um, then you have SRAM, which requires you to, to access data in the cache. Um, then you have maybe level two cache and level three cache, which are, which are larger, but kind of further away from, um, from the ALU. 
Um, and then you have DRAM, which stores a lot of data, maybe a whole program, and then you have you know, disks and remote storage and stuff like that. Okay, so all this, all this hierarchy kind of works to, to, so that the data is in registers or in level one cache whenever your program actually needs it, regardless of where that data resides, uh, you know, maybe, in, maybe in the entirety of the internet. Okay, so on a processor, you would have your main memory and then you would have your different levels of caches and then the CPU. Uh, you know, sometimes level one, level two, level three cache is actually the inside the CPU. You can think of this more as an ALU. Um, and here we're going to transfer data at the, at the granularity of words, right? So you can load a single word from memory or, you know, a, a single uh, you know, maybe we're talking about like a long word, like 64 bits moving into a register in NASM, but the transfer from memory to level cache to level three cache would happen at a level of a whole block, right? So we're not moving a single word, we're moving a large block of memory and then a smaller block here and then a smaller block here and eventually just like um, individual memory addresses here. So here's another illustration of, of this hierarchy. We have some level K plus one of cache, which holds a whole bunch of blocks. And then we have level K um, kind of going up in this hierarchy, which has the capacity for a smaller number of blocks. So let's say we're trying to read data from location four. Okay, great. That's actually located in this cache. So that's going to be a hit. We can pass this on up. Um, or if we try to read uh, memory location five, it's not in this cache, so this is going to be a miss. And then before we get to complete this read, we need the hardware to look into the higher level cache, um, find block five, move it into our cache, and only then we can do the read. Now when we move the block five into this cache, we need to replace something. And so there's different policies for replacing data in caches. And the goal is to minimize the miss ratio, right? So we wanna kind of replace data in this cache so that um, the number of misses where we need to go down here to get the block is as small as possible. So let's look at um, how caches are actually built at the bit level. So what we have is the main memory here with some number of words, right? right? These are individual addresses, individual I don't know, variables, right? Or basically individual addresses. And we can logically organize those into some set of blocks. Okay, so a block is, contains a whole number of addresses. And then that whole block would be moved into the cache. Okay, so we would have these, this word, this word, this word kind of being here, word one, word two, word three, word four, et cetera, okay? Um, so we have K words here and K words here in this block. And then each block is going to be identified by a tag number uh, or just by a tag, uh, which is a portion of an address. And I'll show you guys in detail how this works. So what's actually stored in the cache is the data and also the identifier of which block is actually stored in this cache, right? We can't store every block in here. So if there's data present here, we gotta say, okay, this data actually corresponds to this particular block um, in memory, okay? The question, a question behind caches is, uh, how do we actually locate data um, in the cache? So here we have all of memory at the bottom, okay? Um, and here we have a cache. And so the cache only has a small number of blocks. Here we have eight blocks that can be stored while there's a much larger number of blocks in memory. So what makes caches fast or one of the ways to improve to implement caches quickly is to al allow only certain blocks of memory to be stored in certain blocks of the cache, okay? So here we can look at the gray blocks, which all end in 001, okay? So everything that ends in 001 
could be stored in cache with the tag number of 001. Okay? And everything that ends with 101 would be could be stored at this location. So you in the cache you can either have this block of memory or this block mem of memory in this location but you can't have both this block and this block in the cache at the same time because both of them would have to be stored in this location. Okay? This is called directly mapped cache. Okay? So we have the block address, which is let's say 00101, modulo the number of blocks in cache, which is eight. Okay, so modulo will give you 101 and that's where this needs to be stored. So the question then is, once we have data in cache, um, how do we know which of these blocks is stored? Well, that will depend on the tag. I'll show you guys that in a second. Um, and also we need to know if there's data stored in this location because we could be trying to read some memory that ends in 011, but it hasn't actually been loaded in memory. So we also need to keep track using a valid bit of whether or not data is present in, in the cache. Okay. So here's another illustration of a directly mapped cache where we have some set of sets. Those sets would be um, kind of these memory locations in the cache. Those are the sets. Um, and each set contains the cache block, the actual memory we're storing. It contains a tag and it contains the valid bit saying, is there data actually loaded in here or not? Okay. So when we look at a memory address, this is kind of, this is the thing you would say, you know, move into REX from brackets, some memory location. That memory location would be an address in uh, x86, it would be a 32-bit address in x64 uh, um, for NASM, this would be a 64-bit address. Um, we would break down this address to find a particular place in the cache. Okay, So um, let's look at this. So we have inside a memory block, let me just go back up here, we have some number of words. Okay? For each block, you can number those words zero through whatever. Right, we can kind of restart the numbering here. These are basically the least significant bits of the address. Okay, so if you think of addresses being, oh, I don't know, base 10, right, this would be 0 through 9, and then you would have the next block also going 0 through 9, except it would be, you know, 10, 11, 12, etc., but the least significant number would still be 0 through 9. Okay, so you can think of these least significant bits as being the block offset. Or being, or rather, which you know, is this the zeroth element, the first element, the second element, etc. Okay. So, what we have then is is the set index, okay, which is basically tells us which cache location or which set can contain the cache block. Okay. So this goes back to here. So we have some memory block. Okay, ending in 101, right? And those would be mapped to this memory location. So first, we have the block offset, which is which word we're using, let's say zero through nine, okay? Then we have the set index, which will identify the set we, that they can be stored at. And then we'll have the most significant bits, which will represent the tag or uh, this field saying which block is actually in here. Let's back up. So let's say that we're storing in this cache location memory from this block. Okay, so after this, we would have some block offset. We don't worry about that now. Here we have the um, set index. Okay, and the tag would be the first two bits here, the zero, zero. Okay, so you can see that all these different blue memory locations end in 101, so one of them will be here, but which one? Well, they're only different by the first two bits. Um, sorry. They're only different by the first two bits, so 
we can set the tag to let's say zero zero right and if the tag equals zero zero then we know that this memory location corresponds to um, corresponds to this this block here if the tag is equal to let's say one zero well then we know we're talking about this memory this block being stored in this uh, cache set right so that's the tag and then valid would be set when we load data into into the cache um, and now we know that that data in cache actually contains something that's that has been loaded that's not just some random bits that are stored in hardware Okay, so that is directly associated cache or directly mapped cache. So here's the process of finding the data inside the cache. First, um, we're going to look at the, at the memory address and we're going to look at the set index bits. And based on that, we'll identify the set. Then we will look at whether or not the data is valid. Okay, great. And we will look at whether or not the tag matches the tag of this address. And then finally, if it does, we will look for the block offset and we will find the word that we care about here. Okay. So let's look at an example of a uh, directly mapped cache. Um, here's our initial state. Um, nothing is valid. There's nothing, there's no tags, there's no data but here is the set index that we care about so we're going to load address 22 okay so what we have here is the binary 22 we can break this down into the index okay so we're going to store data here okay and we're going to um, set the tag to being 10 which is the most significant bits and we're going to set this to be valid and now we load the memory the actual value of data that is stored at this location okay um, here i should have said we have one word per block so that means that we have no block offset and that's why we're just looking at um, just these bits right there's no block offset this is the actual uh, that's, that's the whole address right this is kind of a simplified example okay so then we try to load address 26. Great, we break this down into binary. We look at the index, okay, find the index in our cache, set the tag to 11, set or to 11, um, set the valid bit to yes, and load the memory from that location or the value of memory from that location into the cache. Okay. So then we have these two addresses, these two accesses, okay. Well, we can do the lookup for one set 110 great we can check that memory have been has been loaded yes we can see that the tag matches our address so we can read memory from this location this is a hit similarly for this address this would also be a hit okay so then we have these memory accesses okay we can load data into here this was a miss but now we loaded the data then we have another miss at this location we load the data okay and then we have an access on this location and this would be a hit okay so as you're kind of accessing data reading and writing you would be pulling data into cache and if you into the cache and if you already have it then it's a hit if you don't have it it's a miss and you'd like to organize this to have as many hits as possible okay so here's an example of a miss where we had data loaded here, okay, at index uh, 101, tag was 11, and it was a valid data. But now we're accessing word 18, which has the same index number, okay, but the tag is different. So this is a miss, which means we need to pull data from that memory location before we can complete um, the read. Okay, well, what happens if we have larger blocks, right? So in this example, we only had one word per block, but when we talked about this earlier, we said there's this block offset, okay? So we can potentially store multiple words per block and then we need to kind of get, get to them. So let's say that we have 64 blocks in our cache, that's our space, 
and there are six, 16 bytes per block. Right? So we need block offset. So if we have, if we get some address like 1200, where would it map to in this cache? Okay. Well, we can um, compute the block address by dividing the memory address okay, by bytes per block. Okay, this will tell us kind of which block we're in. And the floor of that is equal to 75, so we are in 75th block. Okay. Now the question is, where does the 75th block lay? Well, it's not in the first 64 blocks, so we need to wrap around, which means we can do 75 modulo 64, and so our index is going to be 11. Okay. So based on this kind of design, you can say, all right, well, the offset is going to take four bits. Why four bits? Well, because we have 16 bytes per block, and so to uniquely identify a byte, we need to have four bits of offset. Okay. We need six bits of index, okay. and that is used to store uh, the, the possible number of modular numbers. So to basically, based on the number of blocks, we need an index into the block set. Okay? And then the rest of the address is the tag. So that's how we come up with, these, with the breakdown of the address, which is dependent on the number of blocks in your cache, or the number of sets in your cache, okay? and uh, the number of bytes, um, or words, or however you want to define it, uh, however you want your loads to work uh, per block. So you might ask, well, why not just have really big blocks? Um, would that be better? Okay. So we can look at a graph that compares the block size with the cache miss rate. Okay. And so what happens is as we are increasing block size, our miss rate initially decreases and then starts increasing. Okay. So the reason we get this initial decrease is because we're taking advantage of spatial locality where we can load, let's say we're doing operations on arrays, we can load more of the array into the memory. But if we're working on pretty small arrays but our blocks are very large, we're loading a lot of data that we don't need and eventually that prevents us from um, taking advantage of temporal locality where we're using data that we previously used. Right? If we're loading really big blocks, anytime we want to just access one element, we are displacing a lot of data that we have previously used, and that, then we're losing spatial locality. Okay? So you can also see that as we increase cache size, right, this effect is less and less pronounced because you know, we have space for everything, so um, it kind of doesn't matter how we divide it into block size. The, the disadvantage, though, is that as the cache gets bigger, it potentially gets slower because there's just greater distance for the electricity to go to find your data, and there's the lookups get more complex. Okay, so there's, um, you know, we want to have very fast access using a small cache, and then slower accesses that actually contain more and more of the data we need as the caches get bigger in kind of the lower levels of the cache, uh, of the memory hierarchy. Okay, um, so what happens on a cache miss? Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, if you can't get the data out of the memory module inside your processor pipeline, the pipeline is going to stall, right? Basically everything stops and the hardware fetches data from somewhere else in the memory hierarchy and loads it into the cache and then your processor can actually read data from the cache or from you know, what we call the memory module and then proceed with the operation. Right? So cache misses are expensive and then they stall um, the CPU pipeline. Okay? What happens though when you're trying to write data into memory? Okay? So when you say move data from a register into a particular memory location, you're really writing the data into the cache, but then we want 
the state of the cache and the state of the memory to be consistent, right? Ultimately, you do want to write the data to memory, not just the cache. So question for you guys, good place to pause, is how would you actually design this mechanism? What are the kind of trade-offs that uh, exist and how would, you, um, how would you implement it? How would you write data to cache and then have it appear in memory? Okay, good time to pause the video. So there are basically two options for this, write through and write back. On write through, um, you would, if you have a, a miss, you would first load the data to memory, but if you have a, a hit when you're trying to write to a block that is in memory, um, that data would be written right away into, into memory. Okay, so you would kind of pause everything and change the data in the cache, and then change, uh, change data in memory. Um, so what the one difference here between those two mechanisms is the write allocate versus the no write allocate system, okay? So for write allocate, you would first load data into the cache, then change it, then, then write it back into memory, with no write allocate, if you're trying to write to some location in memory, but that memory is not in cache, you would be able to write directly to, to memory. And okay? so those are kind of the two different options. The problem with write through is that it's, uh, it's, while it's simple to implement, it actually takes a bunch of time because for every write, you have to go to memory and that can take, um, you know, hundreds of cycles. So ultimately what you want is to kind of implement a write buffer um, where you are writing to memory in parallel to all the other executions, right? So only if the write buffer is full, you would actually stall the pipeline. Um, the alternative um, is to do a write back where um, if your data is in cache, you would update it in cache and keep updating that block in cache um, and only write to memory when you need to evict that, that block from the cache because you need to put something else there. Okay? So what you would also need to do is keep an extra bit called the dirty bit um, to mark a cache block as being overwritten um, so, then, so that when you are evicting it from your cache, you would know to write it to, to memory. Okay. Um, one challenge there is that um, you need to be careful when writing to, to a, a write back cache because even though you're writing to a cache and there's a block there, you still need to check that it's the right block that you're changing, uh, in which you're changing memory. Okay. So which one do you think would be faster, write through or write back? Well, write back would be faster because you're doing more writes to the cache for every write to memory. So if you're going through an array that's whose memory is in the cache block, you'd be doing multiple changes potentially to that array and only change memory when you, um, when you evict that block from memory. So we talked about directly mapped caches, um, but as you've probably observed, they have this problem where data from memory can only reside in certain places in the cache. So a lot of the cache can actually go unused um, if we're using data from kind of the same sets. Um, the reason this isn't much of a problem, actually, let me back up, um, is, okay, so the, the problem is, let me explain this. Um, you know, we can't have this block and this block in memory at the same time, right? Because they all both need to reside in this location. So if we're accessing data only in the highlighted blocks, well, then we're not really using all of the cache. The reason this isn't a huge problem is that data in memory is also accessed sort of sequentially, right? So we're using, there's some locality of data. So we're using maybe all these blocks and these three blocks can safely all reside in the cache. Um, right, it's unlikely that we're going to be accessing memory kind of in this spread pattern, although, you know, it does happen, especially as we get 
um, especially as we get smaller blocks. Right? So what we'd want to do is to keep, want to keep more blocks in memory. And the way we can do that, there we go, is using associative caches. So instead of each memory set containing one block, each memory set now can contain multiple blocks. Um, or under fully associative cache, we can have um, any memory block being placed in any set inside the cache. Okay? This is more expensive in terms of hardware. This is a little bit less expensive. So n set associative caching is often used in practice. Let's look at an example. Okay. So now instead of having one cache per set, now we can have two or n uh, cache blocks per set. Okay. So when we are loading or when we're accessing memory, we still have the block offset, which will kind of identify the, the data um, byte or word inside this cache block. We have the set index, which identifies the set, but now the tag, instead of being having just one tag in the set, we have multiple tags. And so we can check both of them to see if any one of these matches the tag of the address that we want to read. Okay, and if it does, then we can just read the data in that matching um, cache block. Okay, so what happens is we have a memory address, we look at the set, we find the set, we look at all the tags, see if one of them matches the tag that we're trying to access. Okay, this one does. This is valid memory, great. Now we can use the block offset to find the right word um, in the block. Okay. So here's kind of another comparison of this. Uh, when we have directly mapped cache, we're using the line or the set index to find the right cache block. This matches the tag, okay? Um, and then based on that, we can compare the tag. And if it matches with the tag, then um, we have, we can look up the word based on the word here, or rather the block offset. And then we can access the memory, otherwise we have a miss. So what we're doing is we're taking the line, finding the set, taking the tag, comparing it with the tag. This is just a one-to-one -one comparison. And based on that, we can look up um, the word in cache. When we have a K associated of cache, what we're doing is we're taking the set and we're identifying the whole set of data. Then we're taking all the different tags, comparing them with this tag, and then based on that, finding the right, um, the right block and the right offset. And so this is going to be more expensive hardware. And if we are using a fully associative cache, we need to basically treat all of this memory, that's not the byte offset as a tag, compare it against all the other tags. And if one of them matches, then we have a hit. We can then use the word to find the offset. Otherwise, we're going to go to memory and try to find um, the right data. Okay, so that's kind of the, the comparison here. So finally, let's look at an example of how things fit in, in a cache under these different examples. So um, let's say we have uh, four block caches. Okay? Uh, we look at directly mapped, two-way set associative, and fully associative. And we're going to be accessing um, these set of blocks, eight, sorry, 0, 8, 0, 6, and 8. So what happens is we're looking at the block address zero. Okay, this will map to cache address zero under four block caches, and um, this is going to be a miss because we're just loading this memory. Um, okay, then we look at block address eight. This also matches to or maps to cache index zero. Okay, and so now we have a miss. We need to replace. Then zero, we have a miss, we need to replace because both of these match to the same set, which is here set zero, okay? Then we're looking at block six that uh, maps to cache index zero or set zero. So we're here, we can load this memory in here and then we're accessing it again. 
Well, it's another miss because the last thing we had in the set zero was block address zero, and so we just keep missing on this, right? There's a high degree of conflict in this directly mapped cache for this set. Okay, when we have a two-way set associative cache, um, we're accessing the same set of blocks in the same order, but now all of them happen to map to cache index zero or this first set. Okay, we have the same kind of cache size, but now only two sets and each of them can store um, uh, multiple, multiple blocks. Okay, so we load memory location zero. Okay, it goes here. We load memory location eight, goes into the same set. It is a miss, but we place it here because this set is being already used for the other memory location, um, memory location zero. So then we want to look at zero again. Okay, great. That's now in cache. Okay. We want to access six. Well, six also maps to zero. And so we need to kick something out. Well, maybe we can use least recently used policy. So we're going to kick out eight. Okay. But then that was a wrong decision because we do need to access eight. And so we load it back into here. Okay, so there's still some cache misses, but it's a little bit better than here, right? Here we basically had two cache hits. Here we have four, right? Using the same cache space. But when we go to fully um, associative cache, we can load all these addresses and we can place them kind of wherever. So other than... Uh, these three misses where we initially need to load data, okay, um, we end up actually, um, sorry, other than these initial misses, everything else ends up being a hit. Actually, wait, let me rephrase the hits. Um, so I kind of looked at the, at the black things as, as hits, but that's not quite right. So in this example, we have no hits, right? There's no memory we can reuse under this access. Every single memory access is a miss because we need to either replace something or pull new data into memory. Here, we have one hit where we're able to access zero, block access zero, which has already been in memory, okay? Under fully associative cache, we have two hits where uh, when we access zero again, and when we access eight again, um, we have hits because that, may, that data has been in the cache. Okay, why do we still have three misses? Well, we still need to load the data in memory when we first time uh, see an access to a particular memory location. Okay, so here's an effect of, uh, let's see which way, yeah, let's look at this graph. Um, actually, let's look at this graph. So what we have here is the hit ratio under different cache sizes, okay? And so you can see that as your cache size increases, so does your hit ratio, but then there's this effect also of increased hit ratios between directly mapped caches and caches which have more, uh, which are two-way, four-way, eight-way, and 16-way, okay? So there's this diminishing marginal return from having more fully associative caches and that's why in practice, you know, we can use something like an eight-way cache or a 16-way cache. We don't need to go to fully associative because the benefits are just not that large, especially as we get to larger cache sizes. Okay, this graph basically shows you uh, the same thing as we move to, from one-way to eight-way associative cache. And as cache sizes increase, um, the hit rate decreases. All right. Um, so... When you have, um, when you're loading new data into the cache, you may need to replace something that has already been there. So when you're using the directly mapped cache, you have no choice what you replace. Everything maps to its own location. When you have set associative caches, um, you can prefer non-valid entries, right? If there is one, so if you're loading data into memory and there's space that hasn't been used, obviously use that. Otherwise you have to use, you have to evict something and then you can use the least recently used policy, right? To use some, so basically kick out the oldest entry that you have, 
this takes a fair amount of work to keep track of what has been least recently used. So what you might do is to actually just kick out a random thing. It's much simpler to implement, which actually may make it faster, right? depending on kind of how big your cache is. And then finally, your cache performance, something to keep in mind is that your cache performance actually depends on the access patterns of your algorithm or how your algorithm chooses to, uh, decides to um, access memory. So we can compare two different sort algorithms, radix sort and quick sort. And depending on the size of the array that you're sorting, you, we can look at instructions per item, cycles per item, and cache misses per item. So what happens is as you have more um, items, quick sort will kind of increase the number of instructions you need to execute on average per item, whereas radix sort will um, kind of decrease over time. So there's still an increase in the running time of the program, but um, it actually ends up decreasing the per uh, item number of instructions, right? When you talk about cycles per item, Right? That actually grows for both programs, but there's just no cross. And when you're looking at cache misses, you can see that Quicksort is actually much more efficient at using the cache hierarchy than Radix sort. Right? So even though using fewer instructions per item here, cycles per item is actually higher for Radix sort because Radix sort is spending more time fetching data from lower levels in the in the memory hierarchy, whereas Quicksort has a much better spatial um, access patterns. Okay. So here's um, kind of an interesting thing that happens between different programs. So there's a lot of stuff in your book if you want to get into it on how to optimize your programs to use caches effectively. I think that's pretty interesting. We just don't have time to get into it right now. Um, but if you have time and inclination, I would encourage you to check out what your book says about it. All right. Thank you, guys.